Welcome back. Welcome. So we're going to start now with the Stan Groff doing the implications of consciousness research for psychiatry, psychology, and psychotherapy. I'd like to ask you to help me welcome Dr. Groff back to the stage. Okay, good morning again. Uh, I ask if I can sit through this. Uh, it's not just a geriatric thing, but I had a couple of uh, car accidents. I have a hip replacement and I had a fusion in my... Uh, so it's a, it's a little challenge for me to, to stand for a long time. So I hope I didn't confuse the cameras. Or Are we okay? okay so... Um, um, the topic I would like to cover is the observations uh, which we uh, which we have made over over decades, working uh, not just with psychedelics but with what I call holotropic states of consciousness, which would include uh, shamanic work, for example, it would include holotropic breath work or some other powerful forms of psychotherapy, all the different types of non-ordinary states that move thus toward wholeness, the way I described it you know, earlier. So if you do this kind of work, you would experience and see many things for which current psychiatry, psychology has absolutely no explanation. And uh, if they deal with it at all, they would uh, refer to it as anomalous phenomena. We have now a whole sort of development of you know, studying anomalous phenomena. Uh, now, um, Thomas Kuhn, uh, 1962, uh, wrote a very influential book, which was called Structure of Scientific uh, Revolution, where after 15 years of uh, studying the history of science, he found out that science is not what people usually think, uh, like an accumulation uh, of more and more information and formulation, ever more accurate uh, hypotheses and theories until we reach our current uh, understanding, which is the top of anything that has ever been achieved in the whole history of humanity. We have a more accurate understanding of everything, of ourselves, of the universe, than any other group has ever had. Uh, so that is a kind of a linear accumulation of, of knowledge. He found out that actually the, the history of uh, science breaks down into distinct periods, each of them is governed by what he called paradigm, a certain set of assumptions, uh, metaphysical, uh, basic metaphysical uh, beliefs and so on, of um, suggestion how to conduct research, how to accumulate, what are the relevant topics to look at. And uh, so there's a certain period uh, where the academic community is governed by this paradigm. And then sooner or later it happens that uh, observations come that start challenging the paradigm. Usually at the beginning it's just dismissed. This was bad research, uh, the guy was not a good uh, uh, scientist, some mistakes were made, or even accusing people of uh, being crazy or um, being uh, dishonest. Einstein, Einstein was initially considered to be crazy, it was so wild what he was presenting. Uh, but that what happens uh, that after a while, new information, new observations are made that point in the same direction, and the paradigm is undermined, and it becomes very clear that there is a crisis. And in that crisis, uh, is the um, called the uh, period of abnormal science. Kuhn said uh, the the normal science is when the academic uh, community is governed by a particular paradigm, and the scientific uh, work, according to him, is similar to chess, problem solving within a set of established parameters. So in, if you play chess, you have to play it by, by rules. You, you don't take the inconvenient uh, piece out of, uh, out of the chessboard, you know, or, or turn a, a peon into a bishop or whatever. Uh, so you have to play it by rules. And now in the period of abnormal science, Everything is questioned, and it's allowed to come with wilder and wilder alternatives until one 
alternative emerges as the new paradigm, and that becomes this uh, obligatory set of rules for the next period until more observations come that challenge that new paradigm. Usually you uh, also uh, rewrite the history of science. Suddenly you have new heroes, people who had the foresight somewhere went way back to see it the way it's now becoming, uh, becoming a scientific fact. Uh, so in this abnormal period, uh, you end up with anomalous phenomena, some observations that the, the, the paradigm cannot explain. So just to give you three quick um, uh, ideas about uh, the paradigm shifts, one major was uh, from uh, the geocentric to the heliocentric system. I don't know if you, if you are aware of the fact that it took 100 years from Copernicus, the Sidereus Nuncius, until it was accepted. And the, the opposition was not just from the church, it was coming from academic circles. There were all kinds of arguments why, uh, you know, the earth uh, um, is, not, is not the center of the universe and it's the sun. Uh, the other one was um, movement from the phlogiston chemistry. It was Becher's uh, idea. There were all the substances were combinations of this royal substance called phlogiston and something else. And again, there were people like Lavoisier Delton who started talking about atoms. And people got fired because they don't believe in phlogiston anymore. No, today we hear about, you know, phlogiston, we would, we would laugh. And the next major one that we experience is the first three decades of the 20th century, the movement from uh, Newtonian physics first to uh, theories of relativity and then further to uh, quantum physics that even Einstein who actually uh, inspired the development of quantum physics could not accept until his until his death you know that God doesn't play dice so um, this is the question of the paradigm shift now is there any indication that we are at a time of a major paradigm shift right now we have enormous amount of anomalous uh, observations that came, of course, first from quantum relativistic physics, but now we have the, uh, the sciences that study consciousness, enormous amount of anomalous phenomena. Somebody is being operated on, they have cardiac arrest, they might even have uh, flat uh, EEG, and consciousness goes out of the body, and they're watching the, what's happening, and then you know, they decide to go for a trip, they go through the walls, to check what's happening in other um, rooms of the, of the building, or they go through the ceiling and check what's happening around the uh, hospital, or go and experience something that's um, miles or hundreds of miles away. And if you have an open-minded researcher, you would come that these things were actually happening. It can be confirmed. Ken Ring, who's a you know, prominent uh, thanatologist, uh, published a book uh, which is called Mindsight, which is a study of a group of people who were organically blind from birth. And when they had a near-death experience, when their consciousness left the body, they could see. They could see what's happening in the, in the room. And he came up with the concept of veridical out-of-body experiences. Not, not only do they see for the first time in life, but what they see can be verified by people, uh, you know, who, who have the gift of vision. Now, this is a paradigm challenge if I've ever seen one. Okay. Now, you don't have to have a medical, medical uh, education to know that if you have your eyes closed, you should not be seen anything from the, from the outer world, let alone watch it from the from the ceiling or, or see something that's happening, you know, thousand miles away. So we have any number of those kinds of observations from psychedelic research, from thanatology, we have parapsychological research that has been uh, questioned, observations from powerful forms of experiential psychotherapy, like holotropic breathwork, when we see these kinds of things. So I will focus today on what we have, what we have seen that challenges the current paradigm. Now, you will see that if you look at uh, these observations and experiences from holotropic states, like psychedelics and the other forms, 
there's not much left from current psychology, psychology and psychiatry. This is all based on wrong, fundamental wrong premises. Now, this is very, <clears throat> very important. Uh, it's just we want to, we want a correct way of understanding the psyche, so we can also treat it, you know, in a in a correct way. But since this is a um, psychedelic conference, this kind of revision is important because until that happens, the academic circles will not embrace psychedelic research. That they, uh, you know, thera therapy is happening by inducing experiences that we consider pathological, psycho-spiritual death, rebirth, past life experiences, archetypal experiences, something from the collective unconscious. When it happens spontaneously, people get diagnosis. They would be hospitalized for that, okay? So, on the other hand, if these changes are made that came from the study of consciousness, then uh, psychedelics would be a logical next step. This is the most most uh, logical, powerful tool for, for psychiatry. At this point, we are in a paradigm clash that, that the experiences that go beyond the current model would be seen as produced by some unknown pathological process that hits the, hits the brain. <clears throat> okay, so what are, the, what are the changes that we would have to make? Uh, usually people, when they reach you know, 80 years of age and they did some research in their life, they look back and what have I found, what, do, what conclusions do I make? So I wrote a paper which was published, I think, about six years ago in the Journal of Transpersonal Psychology, which was called Revision and Re-Enchantment of Psychology, based on these about 60 years of study of these states. So what I will be sharing, this, is, this was really part of that, of that paper. It was also then published in Czech translation in Prague, but they didn't include it into the main body of the Czech psychiatry. They put it in a, in a um, section which was uh, our readings, our readers are writing us. Okay. Uh, so um, what are the changes? So the first change is in the very model of the psyche, the cartography of the psyche. What are the dimensions of our psyche? And we are using a model which is limited to postnatal biography and to the Freudian individual unconscious, uh, which is also a derivative of, uh, of individual uh, you know, postnatal biography. So um, Freud has been criticized for all kinds of things, but something that the psychiatry psychology has accepted is the idea that Basically, the psychological history starts after we are born. He said, uh, the newborn is a tabula rasa. The newborn is a clean slate. There's nothing there that precedes birth, including birth itself. So, current psychiatry does not see birth as being a trauma. You know, 30, 40 hours spent in the birth canal are not seen as a, as a trauma. But when you are born, the nuances of nursing are accepted as, you know, potentially um, pathogenic uh, factors. There's even an agreement that bonding, the exchange of looks between the mother and the child, can influence the whole history um, of the relationship between the mother and the child. So the newborn is able to respond to subtleties of exchanges of looks with the mother and subtleties of nursing, but the, what the hours of, of the travel through the birth canal don't count. There was not consciousness there yet. Uh, actually, and it was until 1960 when the medical profession believed that newborns don't have consciousness, that if they respond to, to some kind of uh, noxious stimulus, uh, that this is just a muscular reaction, it's just a reflex. So this was 1960, you know, that was, uh, they started sort of considering it. And I think uh, about a year ago, there was a, uh, there was a um, paper in, uh, uh, that came from, from Oxford. British scientists prove that newborn can experience pain. Well, it, you know, give me a break. I mean, ne the next time will be scientists prove that dogs can experience pain or cats. 
So still today, circumcision in many places is done without, uh, without uh, anesthesia. The idea that there is no consciousness, it's just where they are screaming and they are sort of moving around. It's just a reflex. Okay. So um, the kind of uh, um, cartography that emerges out of this postnatal, you know, things from childhood, things from, from uh, infancy, but there is a powerful record of the hours that we spend in the birth canal. And in non-ordinary states, this can be relieved. The, the emotions can be expressed, can be processed, the way I was talking about it. People have experiences of prenatal life, some of, some of which can be confirmed. There are just major things that happen prenatally, but people feel even things like uh, if the womb was uh, um, welcoming or not welcoming, there was a rejection that was coming already from the, from the maternal organism. Even if it was psychologically, let alone if this was like our age incompatibility, where the, the fetus was for nine months, was actually attacked immunologically. So that all is recorded in the unconscious and you can, you can experience that. So we have to expand the cartography. Besides the postnatal, there is also the perinatal and the prenatal. But it doesn't end there. We have to add another vast realm, which we now call transpersonal. There's a lot of overlap with the Jungian concept of the collective unconscious. This was a major breakthrough that Jung brought. We don't have just the Freudian individual unconscious, which is like a kind of uh, junkyard, you know, rejected uh, postnatal things that we have repressed, forgotten, rejected, and so on. But we also have collective unconscious. And, and Jung had two domains. One was historically, where we can have access to anything that happened in human history. And the other one is uh, the archetypal, the mythological, where we have access in these states to uh, mythological uh, figures and mythological themes, motifs from any culture that has ever existed, whether we know it intellectually or not. So these were the observations that he had. Uh, themes would, you know, motifs would emerge in the dreams of his uh, patients or in some visions of uh, so-called psychotic patients. Uh, that didn't make any sense until he discovered some, some kind of a culture that uh, had this part as part of mythology, something coming from the Gnostic tradition or, you know, from, uh, from uh, Hindu culture or, or some, other, some other parts of the world. So we have access to, in these states, to anything that happened in uh, human history, in principle, poten uh, potentiality, uh, and also to something that is a mythology of any culture that has ever, ever existed. We have that that possibility in non-ordinary states of consciousness. So the image of the psyche that is emerging out of this uh, work starts resembling what we have in the great spiritual philosophies of the East, in, in Buddhism, in Hinduism, where uh, you know, eventually all the, the, all the information about the cosmos becomes, at least in principle, available, uh, available to us. So the uh, second area where we would have to change our uh, thinking in psychiatry would be, but how deep do the roots of emotional and psychosomatic disorders go? Again, in, in uh, academic psychiatry, if something is not organic, if it's not biological, it started sometimes after we were born. And then we have, in, like in classical uh, psychoanalysis, we actually can determine the time that it supposedly started and uh, link it to stages of the libidinal development. So if you have, um, if you have alcoholism, addiction, uh, it would be the oral phase, the, the passive oral phase, before the teeth come. Uh, we also, in some of the psychoanalytic uh, uh, works, they linked... Uh, schizophrenia to the, to the oral phase, some major problems happening between the mother and the child in the, the passive oral stage. 
uh, manic depressive disorders were linked to the active oral phase. There's already biting, there's already uh, teeth. Then uh, obsessive compulsive neurosis would have started like uh, at the time of the toilet training, around the you know, two or three age, uh, year, of, a year of age. Then uh, hysteria, either anxiety hysteria, which would be the phobias, or conversion hysteria, those would start at the time when you're four, and it's related to some major sexual uh, sexual abuse. So this was the this was the scheme uh, that uh, was developed from the early psychoanalytic uh, work. Now, if you if you work with uh, holotropic states, with psychedelics, and so on, you will find out that you will always uh, um, Reveal, it would be always revealed that there are significant connections between uh, the emotional and psychosomatic problems and what happened in our childhood or infancy. Very much the way it's described in psychoanalysis, but the problem is not the, it's not the whole story. If you have some powerful method of exploring the unconscious, uh, which could be, again, psychedelics or some powerful form of, of uh, psychotherapy, or spontaneous episode, which is what we call spiritual emergency, but it could be diagnosed as psychosis, then uh, you will find out that there are deeper roots of these, of these problems. A lot of these issues would have um, roots in the perinatal uh, domain, links to one of the stages of, of birth. Uh, when I was studying these kinds of experiences that people had when the regression went to birth, you can find actually four uh, experiential patterns. I call them four perinatal, basic perinatal matrices. Uh, one constellation of emotions and physical feelings associated to the state of being still in the womb before the onset of the delivery. The, then the second matrix would be the situation where there are contractions in a closed system because the cervix is not open. Then the third matrix is when uh, uh, the cervix opens up and there's a struggle through the birth canal. And the fourth matrix is the actual coming out. So you can link specific uh, types of emotional problems and psychosomatic problems um, as having roots to one or the other uh, perinatal matrix. For example, uh, claustrophobia would be linked to the situation when the womb contracts and, and uh, we are sort of caught, trapped. So the, the beginning of birth is recorded in memory and starts surfacing. We would experience claustrophobia. We have the feeling that the whole world is closing in. We have difficulty breathing. And we have to get out of the environment that brings this kind of association, like, like a subway or an elevator or a small room you know, without windows and so on. Uh, the third matrix, for example, just to just to mention a few, uh, that involves also sexual arousal. That in that stage, the choking and the pain generates uh, energy, which has all the characteristic of sexual energy. It's, it's literally indistinguishable. You know, Freud brought the idea that uh, uh, sexuality doesn't start uh, in puberty, that it starts already on the breast, the oral, anal, urethral, phallic, and so on. Now, this is even more mind-blowing. Our first encounter with sexual energy was before we were even born. Now, what this is, why this is interesting is that it means that our first experience of sexuality was in a very precarious situation. We were inflicting pain or an, on another organism. Another organism was inflicting pain on us. We were choking. We experienced pains, we were experiencing enormous anxiety, we were experiencing pressure on the head. So there you have like matrices for all kinds of psychosomatic problems, migraine headaches and other kinds of headaches, uh, psychogenic asthma, you know, problems, uh, problems with breathing, and also for that whole range of what uh, Kraft Ebbing called psychopathia sexualis. This is because that first experience of sexuality is in a situation 
uh, where um, you know there is there is inflicting pain, experiencing pain. There is this uh, environment. There could be feces. There could be there could be urine. It's a situation where there is anxiety. So any kind of connections between sexuality and all these other things have the deeper roots already in birth. It's not something that happens when you are uh, three years old or, or, or four years old. So you get a completely different understanding of where the, where the um, emotional and psychosomatic problems are uh, coming from. Uh, you also um, would get a sense of uh, where, where certain kinds of religious experiences come from. For example, people who are reliving birth, um, they are not just replaying somehow the memory of what happened to them, but uh, it will take in some of the archetypal images. So the whole process then becomes experience of psycho-spiritual death rebirth. When you are reliving birth, you are emerging. You don't just see the, the light of the operation room or the light of the day if you, if you were born uh, outside of the hospital. But the, uh, the light would have uh, what uh, Jung called numinous quality. It feels, feels sacred, feels uh, spiritual. So it's a combination of very biological rebirth, but also a sort of very major, major spiritual opening. So this, this um, uh, type of experience, death and rebirth, is something that's essential in the ritual and uh, spiritual history of humanity. This is what the shamans experience, the journey into the underworld, death and rebirth. This is what uh, they were inducing in the rites of passage, the, the way it was described by Arnold van Hennep, the, the um, Dutch uh, anthropologist. This is what they were uh, inducing in the ancient mysteries of death and rebirth, the Eleusinian mysteries, the uh, Bacchanalia, the uh, uh, mysteries of Attis and Adonis. In, in uh, Central America, the mysteries of Shibaba, of the, the Mayans and the, the uh, uh, Aztecs and so on, the, the mysteries of Quetzalcoatl. Uh, so this is an extremely, extremely important uh, domain in the psyche that's not taken into consideration at all in, uh, in uh, current psychiatry. The, the idea is that, that you start um, the psychological history after you are born. It's nothing that's of interest for psychiatrists that precedes birth, including birth itself unless the birth is so bad that it irreversibly damages the brain. Then we take it into consideration. But just the experience of hours of passing through the birth canal doesn't count for reasons that I cannot understand. That it, why it wouldn't be a plain logic. I mean, if, if nuances of nursing can make a difference in a person's life, why not whether they were born in two hours or 50 hours? Uh, why shouldn't be important psychologically when they died in the birth canal and they had to be uh, resuscitated? Or why shouldn't it make difference whether they were born by a forceps or by uh, an emergency CSDN section? How come this would be irrelevant in, uh, you know, in uh, the history of the individual? So this is a major correction. Anybody doing psychedelics or working with psychedelics uh, discovers there is a powerful record of birth and, and a lot of uh, issues in our life can be understood from the fact that we carry this in our unconscious. I mentioned before you know, the influence that it has on uh, the, the uh, lifestyle, the strategy of life, the kind of a linear uh, approach to life and so on. Uh, Uh, then we have the uh, contribution that comes from uh, the transpersonal level. There are also roots of, of emotional psychosomatic uh, problems that are transpersonal, not just perinatal. So, for example, I've seen uh, quite a few issues being uh, resolved in connection with people having experiences that they felt were memories of a previous lifetime. When you not only have experiences that come coming from another 
uh, century in another country, but you have the very convincing experience of what has been called déjà vu or déjà vécu. You have the experience and you, this is not new. I, I recognize the situation. I have once experienced that uh, déjà vécu or I have already seen this before, which is déjà vécu. Déjà vu, and then all kinds of interesting connections between these kinds of experiences and our everyday life. I've seen people who, in years of psychoanalysis, were trying to figure out something and didn't find answer, and then in a psychedelic session would find it in a past life experience as a kind of a carryover from a previous uh, previous incarnation. Now, whether we believe in reincarnation or not. If we are therapists, we would deprive ourselves of a very powerful, uh, of a powerful uh, therapeutic mechanism if we don't allow uh, our patients to have past life experiences, or if we put them on tranquilizers if they were, if they were past, you know, had past life experiences. Uh, the other thing is uh, the roots can be in uh, very archetypal. We have seen uh, situations being resolved after people had some powerful archetypal experiences, including one that looked demonic, demonic kind of dark energy emerging, where the session uh, looks almost like an exorcism. I have described this in the book, When the Impossible Happens, when this kind of uh, demonic archetype emerged in the middle of a high-dose LSD session. And um, I, I, describe that situation there, I call it interview with the devil, because it, it was like a devil speaking through the, through the patient when this kind of energy took, took over. So some of the roots are, are archetypal. Now there are also therapeutic mechanisms that become available. I already mentioned reliving birth, uh, reliving past life experiences. But another major transpersonal experience that has therapeutic potential which is experience of um, cosmic unity, experience where the boundaries are melting, you become one with other people, one with humanity, one with nature, one with the universe, one with the divine. Now the problem is that current psychiatry does not have that category, mystical experience, spiritual experience. You get a nasty diagnosis for an experience of cosmic unity. Uh, so again, this has to be changed. You know, this, um, all ancient and native cultures were seeing these experiences as extremely valuable, and they were, they're integrating them into into their uh, worldview and into ritual and spiritual life. So, if this experience is supported and is allowed to run, it will create therapeutic changes like nothing that we have in our armamentarium. No other method that's, that's available in, in psychiatry can do the kind of changes that an integrated mystical experience of cosmic unity can, uh, can do. So we would have to expand the, uh, the cartography of the psyche, adding the, the perinatal domain, the transpersonal domain. Uh, we would see that actually uh, the roots of uh, of psychogenic, uh, emotional, psychosomatic problems don't go just to childhood and infancy, that there is another additional contribution from one of the perinatal matrices and even deeper from the karmic realm, from the archetypal realm or even phylogenetic uh, realm. Now this would seem like very bad news, okay? We thought we, all we have to do is to clear some things in childhood and infancy and we'll be fine and now the playground is the whole universe. But the, the good news is that there are powerful healing mechanisms, mechanisms of transformation that become available on the perinatal and the transpersonal level, and that we have now means of actually reaching those roots. It will not be talking. You cannot talk out birth or some kind of prenatal trauma, anything that's preverbal, you, you cannot reach. And, uh, Again, as I mentioned before, just using uh, tranquilizers or something else to, to suppress symptoms is not therapy. This is just a symptomatic uh, relief. I remember I <laughs> talked about this once and Fritjof Capra was there and he, he at that time was working on, the, on uh, the turning point on the book. And so he was very much interested in these things. 
And uh, when he talked about this kind of uh, symptomatic treatment that we have in psychiatry, he said it would be like driving a car, you know, you're driving a car, you don't know very much about the car, but you know that if a red light comes on on the dash dashboard, it's bad news. So you're driving and there's red light and happens to be a red light that's showing you that they're running out of oil. So you say, I need an expert, so you take it to the garage and you would have a mechanic who says, red light, no problem. It pulls the, out the wires and says, you're fine, nothing's showing, you can go back. So you, you don't want that kind of mechanic. You want a mechanic, not one that makes it impossible for this warning signal to appear. You want somebody who does something with the engine so that it doesn't have to appear. So you want, again, you want, uh, in psychiatry, you want somebody who creates a situation where the symptoms uh, don't have to appear, not the situation where the symptoms would appear if they could, but you make them, you prevent them from coming. And it's more and more the whole uh, psychiatry is becoming now symptomatic treatment, symptomatic suppression. Now, psychiatry historically is a, is a sub-discipline of, uh, of medicine. Now, in medicine, if you would limit your care to symptomatic treatment, that would be a very lousy medicine. Somebody would come with fever and would say, what do we do with fever? Or put him on ice. Okay, see, that no more temperature, fine. Well, this would not be great. You can, you can use symptomatic treatment if you also simultaneously do causal treatment and you also want the patient to feel more comfortable, or if you cannot do anything else. These are currently incurable, so all you can do is to relieve symptoms. So doing this in psychiatry is treating everything as if it were incurable, as if we didn't have any more uh, effective uh, way of changing the situation, and all we can do is to relieve symptoms. When I was studying uh, psychiatry, we still we have sort of the, the concept that they are uncovering techniques and covering techniques. And, uh, you know, uncovering will, takes a little longer time, but there's a, some chance that you will really get to the, to the roots. Whereas uh, the, the covering was if either you cannot do any more because of time uh, problems or if the patient doesn't want any, anything that has to do with, you know, self-exploration and just want relief. They made the choice of going for the, for the covering. But now it's increasingly looking like the uncovering, you know, doesn't exist or the idea that it doesn't work and so on. Because it ultimately doesn't, if it's, if it's just verbal, it doesn't really go deep, deep enough to bring any kind of impressive, impressive results. But that's not true if you have some method in which you can reach the deeper sources like the, the perinatal and the transpersonal, which you can do with psychedelics or some of the powerful forms of experiential uh, psychotherapy. Now I will go to the next one, which is the, which is the strategy of psychotherapy and, and uh, healing. Uh, and that's a very important one. If you look at the, the world of psychotherapy, you know, we have any number of therapeutic schools. And the problem is that there is no fundamental agreement about some really important issues, like what are the basic motivating forces in the psyche. You know, for Freud, it would be sex. For uh, Adlerians, it would be feelings of inferiority that we are trying to cover up. Uh, for Reich, it was we don't have a full sexual life and the libido is jamming and it's creating the character armor and so on. Uh, for Karen Hornheim, the cultural factors, for uh, Sullivan, it was the problems of interpersonal relations and so on. So, you know, what are the basic motivating forces? Why do symptoms develop and what do they mean? This is with fundamental differences. You say you take a phobia to a behaviorist, then you take to a Freudian. A totally different story. And you would be offered a totally different technique as being the method of choice, the scientific way of dealing with this. But also the schools that originally um, uh, were sort of derived from Freudian psychoanalysis, all the disciples 
of Freud that developed their own techniques. Each of them will be, you know, interpreting differently. Uh, now, if it were true that really understanding intellectually what's happening with the, with the patient and coming with the right kind of technique, you know, right interpretation, properly timed interpretations. When I was seven years in psychoanalysis, I was also taught to use strategic silence when you just don't respond at all, you know, rather than responding with questions and so on. So each, each school has different kind of uh, uh, techniques that, that we are using. And if you look at the, uh, when they, uh, people are studying the results, they have not found any significant results in um, these schools, that there will be significant, uh, uh, significantly better results in one school or another. Last very, very interesting book was by um, was Jerome Frank and his uh, daughter Julia, that was from Johns Hopkins, where they were comparing these schools. So there was some difference between people who got some form of psychotherapy or patients who were on the waiting list, but there was no significant difference uh, between, between the schools. And this, the differences seem to be actually inside of the schools, that some of the therapists are known as being better therapists than others. But you cannot say that as a group, you see, Freudians are better results than, than uh, uh, you know, any, any other school. Okay? So if it were true that the intellectual understanding of the problem which is the theory of the school, and then the resulting uh, um, interpretations and, and handling of the situation would really be important. We would have to have significant uh, differences in the results of these schools, which is not happening, which means that, uh, that uh, what is operating there is something that uh, cannot be described, you know, theoretically scientifically, something like the, the quality of the human encounter between the therapist and the client, or the feeling of the client of being uh, unconditionally accepted by another human being, frequently for the first time, because they didn't have it in their own family. Uh, the, you know, feeling of uh, just support, feeling of, of human contact, and so on. Um, so then what... what uh, can work with these holotropic states and or uh, you know psychedelics bring that is different now if you go into this non-ordinary state of consciousness it functions as a as a radar it finds in the in the unconscious the areas which have a strong emotional charge and which also uh, are close to the threshold of consciousness which means they're available for processing on that particular day something else will have to wait you know, three, four sessions before it becomes ripe, because it comes, comes close to the surface, to the position when it can emerge. But things that emerge, in, in my experience, things that emerge in psychedelic sessions, by definition, are relevant, are important, because otherwise they would not emerge in that, in that kind of state. It's, in a way, similar to what Freud was uh, describing for um, dreams. The idea that we carry emotionally loaded uh, material in the unconscious and is held down by the by the sensor, by the by the defenses. When we go to sleep, the sensor is weakened, and so these things start surfacing, and they would disturb sleep. So the the dream work is actually um, disguising. You see this material, so it doesn't wake us up. So for that reason, if you work with dream, you have to work with something that's emotionally important. He called it via regia, working with dreams. Now this is much more true. What emerging in psychedelic sessions is relevant because otherwise it would not emerge. And it's very frequently different from what we would expect on the basis of some theoretical uh, uh, concepts that we got from our specific kind of uh, training. Uh, let's see. We, we are asked to, uh, to really end at 12.30, so um, I usually tell the story which I do, did before the, uh, the breath work that we did, uh, the pre-conference workshop, for my own analysis, so you understand what I'm talking about. 
Um, I had a Freudian uh, training, so seven years, and, um, and there were seven, seven other psychologists, psychiatrists, who were trained by the same analyst who was the president of the Psychoanalytic Association. And uh, uh, his thing that was that he, once in a while he fell asleep during, uh, during psychoanalysis, and we had to do something, try to bring him back, because we felt, we felt it was important to have him present when we were free associating. And um, we were also having seminars where we could ask theoretical questions or discuss case stories and be borrowing books from his library and so on. But we could ask questions. And so one of us asked the question, um, what happens when the psychoanalyst falls asleep during uh, uh, the session? If I keep free associating, does therapy continue or does it require a fully awake uh, psychoanalyst? Now, he wouldn't say this kind of thing doesn't happen. I mean, he knew, we knew, so he had to do something with it. So he said, yeah, it, it can happen. You know, sometimes you're just plain tired, you haven't slept well, you're recovering from a flu. It can happen. You kind of doze off a little. But he said, but if you are in this business long enough, uh, you wake up only when the stuff that's coming up is irrelevant. You see, when, when something really important comes up, you know, you wake up and you're right there. He was also, um, he was um, uh, from Russia and was a great admirer of Ivan Petrovich Pavlov, who got the Nobel Prize for the conditioned reflexes, working with salivating dogs and so on. And Pavlov frequently talked about the inhibition of the cortex you know, and that you can maintain a waking point, like uh, in hypnosis, you know, you, you, the cortex is inhibited, but there's a waking point when you can connect with the, with the hypnotist. And Pavlov's uh, favorite example was a mother who can sleep through heavy noises, but she wakes up when her own child is moaning. And so my analyst said, it's just like Pavlov's mother. When something really relevant comes up, you wake up and you're right there for your analysand. Well, you know, rele relevant by whose definition? Had I had an Adlerian therapist or Fromian therapist, or, you know, they would have fallen asleep and waked up at different parts of my narrative because what's important for one school isn't for another. So this is amazing for, for psychedelics and some of the powerful experiential techniques inducing what I call this holotropic state that what emerges is really relevant, not, not by a definition of some school, but because otherwise it would not be uh, emerging. It has to be strong enough emotionally and has to be available for processing, has to be in a certain position to the threshold of consciousness to emerge. So even if you don't resolve problems, you get a good idea of what you are dealing with and where the problems are in, in your body as well as psychologically, uh, uh, emotionally. So this is, this, you know, no other method has, has that. You can, this saves us this very difficult decision making. What is relevant, what isn't relevant, and what should we address and what should just, we should just uh, let go. Okay, just very quickly, Another change that we would have to make is to take a very different position on spirituality. I mean, you know, current science is monistic, materialistic. So strictly speaking, I mean, if you come up talking about spirit and it's anything spiritual, then what are you talking about? Haven't you learned your science? Don't you know this is a material universe where, you know, consciousness is alive and intelligence are just... Uh, epiphenomena, they're just side products of matter. The only thing that really exists is matter. What are you talking about? What is spirit, you know? So you are superstitious, you are gullible, you are into magical thinking. This is all primary process. You want to be sort of rational and see the world for, for uh, what it is. Now, according to the observations from these states, if your regression in these states goes far enough and reaches at least the perinatal level, then a dimension emerges into your experience, which Jung called numinosity. He actually uh, took it from Rudolf Otto. He, he liked it better than talking it mystical or, or spiritual or, you know, magical or whatever. Uh, it's a nice neutral term 
that basically telling you that now you have a feeling that you are in touch with the dimension of reality which is radically different from your everyday life and you feel that it's actually super ordinated to your ordinary perception. You know, in spiritual literature they talk about awakening where you can be in a full-blown mystical state and actually your everyday uh, existence seems like some kind of dream or hypnosis. You awaken, it's an awakening. You have the feeling that you're getting in touch with dimensions of reality which are more real than what you know from your everyday life. Now, I don't have again time to go into it, but um, I've been for years interested in uh, quantum relativistic physics from the time when we were Fritjof Capra, you know, and, and I were doing joint, joint uh, seminars, uh, talking journeys beyond space and time, where Fritjof would talk about uh, what physicists are finding about the world in quantum relativistic physics. And uh, he would be talking about, you know, meta doesn't really exist. I mean, the deeper you go, the less you're finding until on the subatomic level, you can't even say that something is there. You can just describe the, the probabilities of it. And then, you know, you can see particles emerging out of the dynamic vacuum, uh, creation out of nothing, and they just uh, disappearing. And the whole pro uh, universe is just a process. It's all electromagnetic. Uh, radiation, you know, you, there are no objects in the world, there are only fields. We, we should not really be using uh, nouns because everything is a process. So it would be, you know, Stan Groffing and Oaklanding San Francisco and yeah, because everything is an action. And uh, then we started talking about, you know, the 13.8 billion years ago there was a a dimensionless point, the singularity, and during the Big Bang, the time was created, uh, the space was created, and all the, all the matter that now creates billions of galaxies sort of poured, you know, into existence. Uh, there were white holes, black holes, uh, wormholes. So uh, after lunch, when people people came, they, their mind was totally blown. And so when I came with my stuff, it looked pretty down, down to earth and sober, you know. <laughs> Past lives, why, why not, you know, archetypes, you know. And I was talking about what happens in some special states of mind. But Fritjof was talking about, about you know, the, the material world. And so he also, in Tao of Physics, he showed the conversion between the, uh, the worldview of quantum relativistic physics and what uh, what um, is, is known as the as the perennial uh, philosophy. Now, since then, there were sort of much more specific uh, developments in quantum relativistic physics. I just had a discussion with uh, that was recorded with Amit Goswami, who talks about science within consciousness. We should have science that starts with the fact of consciousness, not with the fact that the world is material. It actually should be up to the materialist to show that what we perceive is really there. It is not such an easy, easy question. What we really know is how we experience the world. What the world is, you know, is a different thing. Astronomy is not about stars. It's about human experiences, what we call stars. Now, we know that even in the most materialistic system, significant parts are added by consciousness. There are no colors in the world. There Science would describe electromagnetic radiation where in certain range we see colors. You know, there are no sounds. The sound is something that's created by, by consciousness. There's certainly no tastes, no, no smells. You know, so we should start there. That this is, we know what, how we experience the world. And then there's other thing, to what extent we can say that these things are really there. Are, are, or is there some deeper, deeper reality, the way and the Hindus talk about it. The, what we perceive is Maya. It's a st kind of a strange sense of uh, uh, illusion. And what's coming out of quantum relativistic physics is now showing, it's showing the same, that what we perceive as solid matter might not be really solid, solid matter. So I'm if really, uh, we're supposed to have half an hour of uh, discussion, but we are asked to to sort of make up for the uh, time that was lost earlier and really 
end uh, on time. I'll be happy to ask a few few questions if you want to come Can here. But we have to. Questions? Hmm? Can we do a few questions, please? Just for a few minutes. Uh, we have a mic uh, in the middle aisle, and so if you've got yeah. some questions, um, come up and ask, and we'll spend just a few minutes as yeah. much as. Uh, okay, maybe just say the last thing that that I have Thank here, uh, which is the. Um, one of the major, you know, conceptual changes would be that consciousness is not and cannot possibly be a product of the brain. Consciousness is something much larger, is a cosmic phenomenon that's a given in the way existence is given. Existence and consciousness are not reducible to anything, anything else. We don't have really any proof that consciousness is coming out of the brain. All we know is there are correlations between what's happening in the brain uh, and uh, states of consciousness, but it's the same relationship that we have in television. See, there are, there's a relationship between the quality of the picture and the sound and what's happening with the components of the set. The correlation is not a proof that the whole program is coming out of that box. You would laugh if somebody would try to figure out you know, all the transistors and the wires and circuits in the television set and believe that they would understand why at 7 o'clock they get a Mickey Mouse cartoon or a Star Trek, you know, that, that the whole secret is in the box. It leaves the possibility that the, the set plays some very important role, but it mediates the program, it doesn't generate it. So this would be a really major kind of metaphysical change that we would have to make in our understanding. Okay. Uh, yeah. <laughs> We're going to ask some questions. Okay. But um, I need to point out that it is lunchtime. So we won't be uh, hurt, our feelings won't be hurt if you have to leave for lunch appointments. But we're going to stay just for as long as uh, 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 Dr. Groff can stay with us for Q&A. Please. I will have to go myself in a, yes, in a while, but uh, yeah. Yeah. I just want to be sure that I really, you know, because of, uh, I explained it in the previous, uh, because of my age and I have listened to a lot of loud music uh, and because of which we are using, so I might not get everything and I really need to understand every, this is, this is uh, Brigitte, my wife, so, so I would use her as her Thank you for ears, which are Thank much better than mine. So our first question, please. Test, test. Thank you. Dr. Graf. OK. OK? I, I can hear, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's almost a little too much, yeah. I've, I've followed you for 25 years, read all your books, and made great use of your techniques, both with myself, in my personal work, and in my community in Hawaii. So thank you very much for your contribution. I have a question and a gift. Um, the question pertains to your first talk today, when you spoke about the shift from hunter-gatherer to a more civilized form of living as being the source of the um, malignant aggression and insatiable greed. Could you speak a little bit more about the mechanisms of that shift? Shift. Uh well, what would happen? Yeah, what happened there? is that um, when it was hunters and gatherers, they just, uh, you know, for the uh, subsistence and survival, they just go and hunt or they collect things, and they just have uh, just about enough for their survival. There was no, no sort of accumulation and hoarding of things and so on. Once agriculture came and the, the cities were developed, there was a possibility of really accumulation of wealth in which took, you know, different forms, including uh, creating, uh, you know, golden ob objects, sculptures, and, and, you know, other kind of possessions that then other groups wanted. So, so you, you created a surplus in, with agriculture and, the, and what developed the civilization that developed in the cities. And so then you have then invasion of other countries to get, get uh, the wealth which was, which was there. So this was a major, major change. Uh, 
Is that answering that? Okay, yeah, thank you. And just 20 seconds for this gift, really. I don't want to take the time. There were, you know, the other things like uh, Maria Gimbutas also talked about the uh, um, this shift with, from the matriarchal society to the patriarchal, which seemed to play a big role in development of, of uh, warfare and so on. This dissertation uh, called Saharasia talks about desertification in the old world, in the cradle of civilization, being in part a source of the shift to warfare and sex repression. And it's fascinating. It's based on Reichian philosophy and Reich's speculation about emotional desertification and armoring, and the thought that maybe with the current global climate crisis, we're facing a recapitulation of our birth trauma as a species into civilization. So I wanted to just offer you this book, and I've bookmarked just the one or two pages that might intrigue you. Thank you Thank so you. much. Um, yeah. I want to remind everybody that a question is an interrogative that ends with your voice going up. So uh, we don't have time for personal comments. I, I want to stress throughout the whole weekend. So please ask your question of uh, Dr. Groff. Thank you. Next question, please. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Groff. Um, with referring to the four phases of uh, perinatal psychology, specifically the third, can you speak to how uh, a cesarean uh, might change the well, third phase and not passing through the birth canal? Yeah. That's, if I talk about birth trauma, that's a very logical uh, question. I, I presume you are asking about uh, what's called non-labor cesarean, elective cesarean, not emergency cesarean, where it would be birth trauma and the additional problems which are added by the intervention. Uh, but if you, if you work with people who are caesarean and doing psychedelics or doing the holotropic breastwork, it would look very, very different. Um, when, you, when you get to the perinatal level, it would be about uh, open wounds, about gushing, uh, gushing blood, sharp objects and so on. Sometimes it opens up into past life experiences, uh, portraying the Aztec sacrifice when the when the body was uh, was opened, and uh, the major trauma there is the rapidity of the transition. Uh, so there's a very different mechanism. If you have uh, labor, then things get very tough and there is struggle. But if there's a reasonable exposure to birth, uh, that the 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 birth is experienced as a personal success, like a hero's journey, so that there is a sense of accomplishment. And it leaves you on a, in a cellular level with a sense of optimism. If problems come in life, I can deal with them. You know, I've done it once, I can do it again. Now, if the birth is too overwhelming, then you end up with a situation, you know, life is too difficult, life is too dangerous, I cannot cope, and so on. So it would undermine your optimism. And the caesarean uh, person would not have that sense uh, at all. There would be just, uh, th there's a memory of some kind of catastrophic event, sudden event, where this, this is done within minutes, the, you know, something reaches in and then they are pulled into a whole other uh, way of existence. So it is not the solution by, by any ch chance, you know. And uh, again, I mentioned in the, in the pre-conference workshop, I'm really concerned with what's happening in the world. And I mentioned an example from last trip to Argentina. Uh, they have 75% caesarean sections. So before we, you know, birth uh, <laughs> three out of four children uh, surgically, we want to know what we are doing psychologically. What kind of humanity are we creating? But again, in, in medicine, you don't think about birth as having any psychological uh, impact. You, it's just a body mechanics, you know, we, we counted fingers and when we were doing obstetrics as students and you put, at that time you put uh, uh, drops in the, in the eye just uh, if the mother had gonorrhea and you sort of look at the blood, blood groups and so on, count the fingers and, uh, you know, if that's everything biologically okay, you don't you are not considered with what impact it might have uh, psychologically. So it is, a, it is also a trauma, major trauma, but a different kind of trauma. 
Uh, I referred, when this question came before, before the pre-conference, to the book by Jane English, which is called A Different Doorway, uh, with the subtitle uh, Adventures of a Caesarean Born. She was a physicist who did some work with us, and she was a caesarean and became so fascinated that actually switched from physics to psychology and was putting specific uh, you know, emphasis on studying the differences. I think we have time for one more question before Dr. Graf has to leave. Let's make it good then, right? Uh, first of all, thank you for sharing your brilliance with us today. Very, very inspiring. Uh, I'm Steve Curtis, and 11 years ago I was diagnosed with a terminal cancer, uh, given two years to live, for which there was no modern medical treatment. And through many of the tools we talk about here, I basically let go of the cancer, uh, which is called the spontaneous remission in medicine, and found there are many more people like me. And so I wanted to ask you about your perspective on these spontaneous remissions, if you've had interactions with them, and then what you think is behind those. What is behind? You know, I've done a lot of work with cancer patients. We had a study in the Maryland Psychiatric Research Center, uh, over 200 uh, patients, but most of them were what's considered terminal. Um, I was with Walter Penke. We were the two physicians who were involved in this project. We spent one day in the oncological unit and doing the, the grand rounds. And when the oncologist gave up on a on patient, when there was nothing they could do, maybe uh, sh you know, short of a hypophysectomy or something, they said, okay, now you can sort of uh, work with the patient. And so we have not really seen any remission there, any kind of impact on cancer. Um, but then um, uh, I went to New York s City to the Thanatological Association, I talk, talked about the result of the, uh, of the cancer study, and then we started getting self-referred patients who came in some earlier. We saw a couple of remissions there, and certainly attempts of the, of the patients to do something with the cancer. They, in many instances, they could connect with it on a cellular level. They were creating, trying to create a healing field or they were trying to cut off the blood supply, you know, either aggressively or in a more kind of loving, kind of a healing. Um, and we saw we saw a couple of those uh, remissions in these people who were uh, who were sort of earlier uh, uh, referrals. Um, and I had a long discussion with Carl Simonton, who was a, a you know oncologist who also was interested in the psychological aspects. He had cancer himself when he was 17 and got over it and then developed a method where, which was using as an addition to oncological treatment when you use um, fantasy, uh, guided, guided fantasy, where you give some form to cancer and some form to the immunological defense and you, you do sort of uh, guided imagery with it. And, uh, you know, he had some interesting uh, uh, results. Um, but he could give people, he could give people a confidence, you see. Because uh, you can get over it, can be done, I have done it. Um, and then when, when other people were trying to, to uh, replicate it, they did not have that element. They would say, well, we give one group of the people will get the real treatment, the oncological, and, and these other guys will also do this, the, the Simonton stuff, you know. The, uh, so if you are if you are using the the mind as a as a force, you have to really use it at its best. You cannot be lukewarm about it. Uh, it was very fascinating. He actually, at one point, he did firewalking, which most of us did in in California. And uh, was, there, you have the sense uh, you achieve something that you thought was absolutely impossible. You see, you know, three meters of uh, glowing embers like two inches, and you think this cannot be done, I mean, this would kill me. And then you walk through and, you know, nothing happened. So I said, what other things do I consider impossible? And so then later he wanted, from in earlier stages, that the, his patients would do firewalking to um, get the sense of the power. 
that, that the conviction has. And he believed that what's, what's operating in cancer is very similar to hexing in uh, native societies, when you have like a bone pointing in, uh, in the Australian Aborigines, that the shaman points a bone at a certain person when they want to destroy them, and the whole tribe knows that this happened, and they discount that person, you treat that person as if they were already dead. It's just a matter of time, you know, they, they were hexed. And uh, so there were instances where Western medicine could not save people who were hexed by a shaman. The most famous thing is the, from Johns Hopkins, which was the Johns Hopkins Bulletin. Again, I don't have time to, to, to tell the whole, uh, whole story. So we believe that, that this, the, the, our attitude to, toward cancer functions as a, as a hex. When somebody gets a diagnosis of cancer, that other people start treating that person as if they were already on the way out. And you, you sort of withdraw the, the, the energies that you get from, from human interaction. And uh, they get into a state which is called given up, giving up syndrome. You know, they are giving up because you feel you have incurable disease and other people kind of somehow withdraw the, the vital connection with you. So we believe that to, to really bring the mind into the treatment of cancer, you have to break that kind of a spell, which he could do, because it can be done. I've done it, you know, you can do it. Thank you. Thank you so much. So, okay. Thank, you. thank Stanislav Groff. Thank you so much. And thank you for staying late. I'm sorry for the delay. We'll be on time. Back 2 o'clock sharp, please, for Amanda's talk, Amanda uh, Fielding's talk from Taboo to Treatment, the Evolution of Psychedelic Medicine. See you, too. Treachery, hatred, violence, absurdity in the average human being to supply any given army on any given day. And the best at murder are those who preach against it. And the best at hate are those who preach love. And the best at war, finally, are those who preach peace. Beware the average man, the average woman. Beware their love. Their love is average, seeks average. But there is genius in their hatred. There's enough genius in their hatred to kill you, to kill anybody. Not wanting solitude, not understanding solitude, they will attempt to destroy anything that differs from their own. Not being able to create art, they will not understand art. They will consider their failure as creators, only as a failure of the world. Not being able to love fully, they will believe your love incomplete, and then they will hate you and their hatred will be perfect, like a shining diamond, like a knife, like a mountain, like a tiger, like hemlock, their finest art.